Yay. I'd like to call to order the uh, meeting of the Sunderland Elementary School Committee uh, January 11th at uh, 6 p.m. 2022. Happy New Year. All right. Um, and then we're going to start with a motion to approve the minutes from November 16th. And as I recall, I was in a volleyball game. I'm going to sit that one out. All right. So moved. Second. Second. Yay. All right. Any Move discussion? That. that was Jessica. Thank you. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Uh, I guess we got to go around, Robin. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Keith? Yes. Outstanding. All right. Let's see. Um, financial statements and warrants. Shelly? Hello. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. I did email you out uh, some information today. I attached the expense reports, which were through December 31st. Uh, I didn't have a formal update, uh, but the warrants signed since the last meeting. There was two months of warrants since we did not meet in December. There were 20 warrants totaling $183,096.18. Um, and then I did attach those expense reports. I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them, but a couple of things that I did want to point out. Um, personnel changes have taken place this year. Ben has had several staffing changes with um, resignations and for various reasons. And so some of our account lines uh, for salaries and wages are going to be over, but then there's others that are going to be under because we've had discussions with every new hire to make sure that we are within budget. Um, if you hired someone over column and step in one spot, we tried to hire under in another to offset those. But you may see some differences, budget versus actual on those reports, and that would be why. Um, and Ben, you might even have a vacancy, an IA, or, you know, I, I can't even keep track anymore. Sunderland's had so many changes. Um, so some of those things may fill in and, and fluctuate again throughout the year. But, um, you know, vacancies, it saves us money in the end because nobody's in that position. Not helpful for the staff or the students. But um, so those are some of the things you might see there. The other thing is special education transportation. Um, I actually think you're going to see this issue on both the general fund and the school choice reports under the transportation line, that there are overages. Um, that's twofold. One, transportation costs have gone up, and that is district-wide for special education transportation. Um, we're seeing routes almost doubled in cost from what they were from prior years. And then uh, the other instance is that we have had some fluctuation in the out-of-district placement transportations. So on the school choice report, if you look at that, you'll see that there's zero budget in the budget column, but there is an expense line. And the reason that that issue exists is because we didn't budget to pay any transportation out of school choice, but the transportation we are paying, we will receive back dollar for dollar in special education increment claims. So it was easiest and smoothest transaction wise, we're essentially using it as an in-out account. So um, that accounts for that overage. And I just wanted to make you aware of those things. I'm not concerned about the budget at this point. Those are just some things that I noticed are fluctuating on the reports and thought that you might have questions about. I'm happy to take other questions if you have them. Just a question about uh, the various other funds that uh, from time to time you give us reports on it, particularly during budget sheets, but it's been a while since we've had those. Can we get them next meeting, I assume? Yeah, so we will talk about school choice during the budget presentation because that's probably the most sensitive topic. Um, I don't have actuals on the other revolving funds, but I will say generally everything is in good shape and on track as we planned with the building up our reserves and school lunch and um, early childhood so that next year we can place wages back on those two accounts. Uh, and I will work to get you an updated actuals for next month, Peter. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Just curious, uh, with regard to the increase in the uh, transportation cost, do you know what the driver of that is? Um, I think part of it is supply and demand. You know, there's not a lot of options in the area for special education transportation. 
Um, and I think probably since we're using some smaller companies that their costs are going up, fuel, you know, other things like that. Um, I think people are having a hard time hiring staff. We know that that's an issue industry wide, doesn't matter what industry you're in. So I think she probably has some of her wages up and, um, you know, I, honestly, part of it could be just the way that things are going with COVID right now. People can charge more for those types of things. It's good to understand. Uh, yeah. And also just a, a shout out to uh, the whole team. Uh, as far as I, yeah, when the outer district uh, stuff goes up, that's that's always a hitter. So I'm glad we do as much as we do with special education to keep as many kids as possible in district, because that's always you know, oh, you know the expenses there are, are savings in general. So this is this is where it gets you if you don't spend that on the upfront. Keith. I just, I'm probably just going to ask you to repeat, but I just want to clarify that the the overage on this uh, the school choice report for transportation we're going to receive back dollar for dollar. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, no other questions. Uh, let's see. I believe what's the uh, principal's report, Ben. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So a couple items to discuss on the principal's report. Number one being the early childhood playground update. Uh, we've accumulated just over $300,000 in cash. So we're sitting on um, just about that amount for the project. Uh, earlier this week, I met with Shelly and Darius to discuss next steps. And then with our landscape design company, I am meeting with them tomorrow to determine um, really where we're going to go from, from here. With, with that amount of money um, and with the projected savings that we've had through um, in-kind donations or labor from town departments, um, local business donations, we think we're ready to break ground once it's uh, thawed out after this uh, winter. So. Um, Hope, hoping that gets going as soon as possible, but realistically, we're looking at a, a timeline probably at the end of the school year and over the summer, so it's not impacting um, student programming while uh, we're in session this spring. So it's really exciting. Um, we'll have more information for the committee and the public come February um, as far as next steps are concerned. Any questions on that? Ben, I just... Just wanted to ask, uh, I, I assume that at some point there'll be more visibility to ways in which people in town can contribute to the process, either uh, in in cash or in kind or through their labor or stuff like that uh, to make, you know, because it is a community project. Absolutely. And so once, um, once I meet with the, the design company and we discuss uh, what it's going to look like, um, for the parts of the project that we'll put out to bid and which parts of the project we'll take care of in-house in our community, then we'll have a better sense of, um, of how that can happen. Okay. Outstanding. And if all goes well, we could hold our September school committee meeting on the playground for next year. Nice. And uh, what else? So ongoing professional development. Uh, Sunderland Elementary School staff are participating in a series of PDs this year. Um, the first, Impact of Poverty on Learning. It's a five session series that focuses on student social emotional learning, classroom and school factors that correlate to improve student outcomes, teaching appropriate approaches to poverty and racial diversity and brain functioning. And additionally, our district is privileged to receive training from Dr. Goldie Muhammad, who's the Associate Professor of Language and Literacy Development at Georgia State University. Dr. Muhammad has authored the book, Cultivating Genius, and she met with um, everyone in our district earlier um, pre-Christmas, pre and that was, that was actually the um, PD day in November. And she's meeting with the district staff again this coming Friday. Her book uh, promotes a teaching framework that's based on equity 
And um, we will look at culturally responsive texts, improving literacy development for all learners, and there will be an overall focus on culturally responsive teaching. So we're really excited to be working with Dr. Muhammad once again. Um, and that is this coming up this Friday. And that's what I had for the principal's report. Outstanding. Any questions? Thank you, Ben. All right, I don't believe there's any uh, public comment unless there's, okay. Uh, then on to uh, unfinished business, uh, COVID-19 update. Yep, good evening. Uh, so I'll kind of go backwards. Uh, this one I'm actually adding to my superintendent's report regarding the, the COVID update. The commissioner released yesterday, in DESE, the Department of Education, um, released that they are extending the mask mandate until the end of February. Um, it was, uh, I guess you could say, one could see that coming, but we were in meetings with him weekly up until this week, and he never gave a hint that it was going to be extended. So he had us, some of us kind of wondering what was going on. Um, so that, that's good news that we're not going to have to worry about that as a committee um, now until, I would say, March, um, and given the way things are right now. Um, I also want to uh, let people know that we have a uh, vaccination clinic this Friday as well at Deerfield Elementary, um, where you can get boosters as well as uh, the COVID vaccine. So you can, um, I believe, Ben, did you send that out? Someone sent it out to the full community, and it's also on our website. Um, yeah, Meg sent that out. Um, and it's also on our website if you want to click to sign up for an appointment. Um, you do have to sign up in advance. There's no walk-ins. Um, we also have created a dashboard for COVID cases in our schools. Um, in, instead of doing the um, repetitive uh, email, uh, blanket email to parents, we, I did feedback from parents, from several parents writing me and catching me at social events um, and saying that um, this you know, causes more anxiety, just getting these emails and not having the full kind of picture of what's going on in the schools. So we created a dashboard and I sent that link out to everybody. You can also find that on our website. Um, we have seen, um, as the schools are representative of the community right now, we do have a, a spike in um, cases the past two weeks. And um, kind of giving the update of Sunderland, I'm pulling it up live now. Um, um, Central Elementary has had 11 cases in the past two weeks, nine last week and two this week. So we are seeing more of that. And, you know, we are doing our um, contact tracing and pool testing and all those things that we're doing prior to where we got that up and running. Um, this week's pool is not in yet. And, and you haven't re I haven't received an email yet. Have you been? No. So um, they're running a little bit longer because there's so many tests and everything. All the tests, even all the tests at GCC go through the same not the same one, but there's only a few testing places um, where they're being run through. So um, we're seeing slower rather than 24 hours turning to 48. Last time we got them, we got four in the morning tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow will be a busy day, I think, in the district because given the the numbers we saw today just on symptomatic testing and then people calling in and telling us um, that must mean that we're gonna get some positive pools back. And that's just the reality of what's going on. Um, and that is, and we updated the uh, the CDC. I think people, it's now kind of a week, two weeks since that, but they they did a uh, update to um, the protocols, um, and those can also be found on our website, um, and also in the link that I sent you in my superintendent's report that we updated ours. That you know they've reduced the amount of time that people have to be out. You don't have to test to return. Um, the governor spoke this morning about. Um, you know, the test and return not being necessary and that it's backlogging those who need to get tested who are symptomatic versus passing a test in order to return. So that's kind of the politics behind things um, that are happening. Um, and so Ben also has created um, what we're talking about tomorrow morning's principal meeting, but also better guidance for families. Um, he sends very clear emails to family about what their options are based on their vaccination status. Um, and what does it look like for them to be out? So it's kind of, we're changing the rules slightly and it's also kind of complicated. We do get, you may have heard from some parents who get frustrated, um, especially um, those people who are 
not vaccinated because it, the system is set up that if you're not vaccinated, there are more stringent rules about returning back to the regular population of schools. So um, I'm just saying that because I've received emails. I know Ben probably has or in many of his phone calls when doing contact tracing. So if you're hearing that as well, but we haven't set those. Those are set by the state. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell. Any questions overall <clears throat> or you know, overall? Direct? Jessica? Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you for the dashboard and Ben for your daily updates when we've got cases in the building. That that um, all of that communication is 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 really useful for as a as a frame of reference. So thank you for making all of that available. Um, uh, I've got several questions. I guess my first one is: Do we have a sense of how many students in our building are vaccinated at this point? Percentage. We do, and I will look for that. Okay. Um, and you can either ask another question or talk quietly amongst yourselves. Um, I think I want your question for our next question, so I'll wait. <laughs> right. In terms of filling in the gap, uh, it was also mentioned at the uh, select board uh, last night that 70% uh, of the people who are getting COVID in Sunderland are unvaccinated. And of the 30% who are vaccinated who have gotten it, very few got the booster. So it's just a little more uh, incentive to go out and get the booster or, or get vaccinated if you haven't done. So these numbers are as of vacation, right before vacation, these numbers were put together and Sunderland uh, students were at 51%. Um, and that's having at least any dose, one or two doses, okay? And then, and then just comparably, Frontier is at 69%. The other, Thank the other, you. The other elementaries are um, Conway's at 50%, Deerfield's at 61%. As I said, here is 51% and Waitley is at 37%. Now, those could have changed if people got vaccinated between now and then, or they didn't report that they were vaccinated when we were trying to get that information, um, or, or didn't attend one of our clinics, because our clinics would feed us that directly through the, the state portal, and we can download that into there. So, um, that's so those numbers are probably slightly higher is what I'm trying to say. But Megan, you got you got a question? I just was curious about the 51% of SES. I'm assuming that's of the students that can be vaccinated or we or? do that of the so yeah, we didn't count pre-K in that. So age-wise, that wasn't we double check that. That's a good catch. That was divided by 183, which is your population, and there's 17 pre-K. So that number will go up. Nice. Good catch, Megan. I'll let Meg know that you caught that. When Meg do it. Sorry, Jessica, you, you had more? Uh, yeah, my, so my other question, um, I, I've been intensively following all of the news about Omicron and sharing concern with many other people um, about what Omicron, which is presently, it's very present in Franklin County, what that could mean for our schools. Um, we're still right now in the process of figuring out how well our set of mitigations are going to hold Omicron from transmitting in our classrooms. I, I have not found any other school systems that have the same set of mitigations we do. Uh, it, the, um, who, who have had those mitigations during the Omicron surge. Uh, Omicron is far more transmissible. Uh, what, I, what I'm getting to is that I hope that we're paying attention. I asked Ben about this, um, paying attention to which students who had been identified as close contacts later um, turn up to have a positive test in, in any you know, setting. Um, and if we get multiple, so Ben told me today that uh, we have one person who last week was identified as a close contact who is now positive, but it's unclear whether they got it from school or somewhere else. I, 
yeah, we don't know where it came from. We're not going to know. So here's my question. If we start to have um, several cases, and I hope this is across the district, um, of people who were identified as close contacts who also come up positive, can we start looking for common threads? Is it, are, you know, are they close contacts during eating times when masks are off? You know, what are the conditions under which they're close contacts? Are they on the bus? You know, which I know is not supposed to count as a close contact, except, you know, today it was single digits when the kids were getting on the bus and I don't think the windows were all open. You know, can can we look for common themes to see where our weaknesses are if we start to see um, even if we even start to suspect in school transmission? Does that make sense? I keep, oh, I keep asking guys every time we email about a COVID thing, I say, I know I'm a broken record, but I wish we were not eating lunch at three feet apart in the cafeteria. I wish we, the kids were further apart to eat. Yep. I mean, we, we can certainly see where the, if there's patterns in, in transmission. Um, as you kind of were saying, it's, it's difficult. You know, we have some cases where we're not sure if it's transmission in school or it could be likely transmission in school. Um, you know, when, when kids hang out together in school and out of school, that, that becomes also, um, you know, which becomes a common theme as well. Um, a lot of these classes across the district are very tight and their friends are doing things in and out of school, that kind of stuff. But I think it's a good idea to look at, you know, um, study the, the larger picture about where the transmission most likely occurred. If we have a pattern, that's a good idea. Thank you. I think that's all my questions for now. Anyone else? I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching this too. I remember uh, a long time ago when we before the Omicron where uh, we were hearing people say, yes, we're, we're contact tracing and we're just able to keep up. Uh, and our numbers now are, are higher than they were then. Granted, it's uh, it's a more contagious. Uh, people are, uh, it doesn't appear to be as deadly, but uh, it looks like it's not going to peak until sometime late January. And we probably won't get back to where we are now, rough projections, till the end of February. So uh, I guess all I'm saying is I'm standing by and uh, wouldn't be surprised if we get an update that something has to change or something has to be done. And uh, you, know, you guys are going to keep doing what you're doing. But uh, as, as new mandates come down from the state of the feds and, and whatever is response to this, uh, I guess I'm not... Uh, I won't be surprised. Just go ahead. If I could just quickly piggyback on that, I just want to make sure that people have a sense of the scale, the scope of what is happening with Omicron right now, that uh, Franklin County's seven day um, case rate is more than seven times higher as our previous peak from a year ago when we had a surge last January, we are now more than seven times higher here in Franklin County, Franklin County, you know, did very well a year ago. Um, our rate stayed relatively low compared to just about everywhere else. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say into the public record in case we've got uh, members of the public watching who are not aware, um, just want to note that we are not allowed by DESE right now to make a preventive pivot because of the, of the surge. All we could do would be to fully close um, and make it up like a snow day. We're not allowed to just go remote because cases are high. Thank you. Peter, you got something? Yeah, we got, I think uh, today, I, I think it was Darius sent us an email about uh, Meg Birch uh, moving on. And uh, obviously, she's been terrific. Uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, she's been essential uh, part of setting up all these protocols that, that uh, really put us head and shoulders ahead of most other school districts that I see. And uh, um, I guess my question is, I, I'm assuming that, you know, you got a plan to keep moving forward and hiring somebody and so on, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping you can make that work because I know she's going to be hard to replace. Yeah, it was, it was in my, I added it to my superintendent's report, but it's probably good to talk about it here since the two are related. So yeah, Meg is now going to become the um, regional nurse um, consultant. Um and basically her territory is Franklin County and Berkshire County. Right now there are seven consultants in the, uh, set up throughout Massachusetts. Um, and and um, so she, they, they've added this before there were, 
And now there's eight, or there's there six, now there's seven. But anyway, they've created this area because of the need and whatnot. So she was hired amongst, um, you know, full pool kind of deal. Uh, but she is actually going to be stationed at a frontier. So we're out of our district. Um, we are the carry through holder of the grant set up by the state. They needed a school. We volunteered our school um, to do that. And so she'll be around to help out. So the transition phase is we're going to be, you know, it's posted now, um, you know, give a couple of weeks to get some applicants in interview phase, looking at a mid February kind of transition, but Meg is going to be around to help with that transition. And her job is to then help new nurse leaders in their role. So officially and unofficially um, we're going to be able to make that transition. And, and, and that position is fully funded by the way, it's going through Frontier is fully funded by the state. And on top of that, um, we get money on top for being the administrator of that position. The Me being the administrator of that position. I don't get the money from the district. Does. So I think like 10% of that. So, you know, it's a good, it's a good thing. She's not going anywhere. She's going to help the transition. We originally, um, the timeline was before things started getting spicy in December was beginning of the school year, we purposely pushed it out to February 15th to get us through this spike. Um, if things get worse, then we will have a conversation um, with Nurse Meg about if, you know, she doesn't want to leave this, this district in a lurch of any sort. Um, and so that's the game kind of game plan there. So we're going to try to have a seamless transition. Um, and again, she will be there um, to support all along the way. Thank you. Outstanding. Keith? Just a quick question for Ben. Um, beyond the, the, the COVID numbers, what has um, absence rates for students been like? And then how has uh, absent rates for staff and how they handled it? We've had, um, since returning, we've, we have had a, a few, a small handful of families keep their kids home just to see what the, um, what it was going to look like. And additionally, when some students have been identified as close contacts, families have chosen to keep their students home to monitor them for a few days. Um, but nothing too overwhelming um, for either of those. And then uh, staff attendance has been very good. And um, we're, we're in good shape right now. So that, that's great to hear. Um, I was just wondering if uh, we've been experiencing the the difficulties with substitutes and staffing all the positions and providing um, what we need for students every day. We we have had some difficulty this year filling positions specifically in um, in special education. I, I will say that we did have our new ETL start today and so we're excited to have her on board and then um, today I signed the dotted line to hire another special education teacher who will be starting two weeks from today. So at, at that point, we'll more or less be fully staffed. Jessica, you had a question? Uh, I, it seemed like the right, right moment to uh, piggyback on what he was saying about the excellent staff attendance. I need to share with the rest of you um, that right before the holiday vacation, I appeared before the select board and they voted to make us uh, special municipal employees which is related to the fact that we don't get paid for serving on school committee. Um, and then they voted on a second exemption so that I, I am volunteering as a substitute in the, in the school. Um, you know, I asked to do this in anticipation of this Omicron surge, and I've been concerned for about, about severe staffing shortages that could result. Um, so the select board approved that. And I've cleared my schedule for two days a week in January to go sub. And last week, both days that I was available, every single teacher was in school. And I just want to voice my admiration and respect and appreciation for all of our amazing staff who are showing up in this moment of great uncertainty um, and clearly are exercising caution in their personal lives so that they can also stay healthy, which helps to keep everybody else healthy as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our teachers. Quite right. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. That's great to hear. And thank you for what you do. Yeah, and thanks for singing their praise, Jessica. And and really, the Sunderland staff have been there for our students and families since since day one. 
um, when the pandemic hit and that it hasn't changed. It hasn't wavered at all. And it's, um, I'm forever grateful for the support they're giving the kids. All right. Well, uh, and with that, I think, uh, next is capital planning update. Peter? I go on that. Thanks. Um, at our last meeting in November, we discussed four items that the school was uh, submitting to the town as part of its, uh, um, as, as its capital request for, for this budget cycle. Um, since then, there's been uh, more developments on the uh, ARPA front, the American Rescue Plan Act uh, something. And uh, in the last uh, just few days, there's been you know additional stuff that has made uh, this, this whole availability of ARPA money uh, easier so that uh, just a quick summary, the town got something just in excess of a million dollars. And the first set of rules was going to be that we could spend about a third of that reasonably on a wide variety of stuff. And the other two thirds only on very specified things. And that might be quite difficult to actually come up with ways to spend it. And so, um, but that was only in, in uh, the initial rules and the final rules that the Treasury Department put out uh, at the end of last week. We're basically saying that for uh, municipal, for towns our size, uh, that you could spend the whole thing on essentially any uh, legitimate uh, municipal purpose, uh, operating or capital. And so uh, we uh, have uh, that money is available. Uh, it can be, uh, it needs to be uh, committed sometime by the end of 2024 and spent sometime before the end of 2026. Uh, so that, uh, um, you know, that's great. I just, before this meeting, we had a meeting of the town's capital planning committee. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I would say that, uh, we got a process, you know, we, it's, it's going to take a bit of doing to figure out exactly what to spend it on. And we're not going to like, okay, spend the million dollars right off the bat. And I'm sure it will come out in several sort of segments or something like that. Do we do it? The process for, for making decisions is actually simpler than in a lot of other things because it doesn't have to go to town meeting. It just has to, you know, any particular item needs approval from the board, from the select board. And, and that's it. Um, the one thing I would say that is, I, what I would say as far as uh, school items is that number one, I don't expect any problem to get all four items that were requested approved, okay, in, in, in this cycle. Uh, I also think that there's, uh, there's certainly other people on the capital planning committee that are very much in favor of getting the window replacement up front and center because that's the kind of project that we would have hard time a harder time getting, you know, town approval is a, you know, we're through an override question or something like that. Uh, it certainly needs to be done. And so uh, we ought to just go ahead and do it. And I, and I think that that would get, at this point, it would get very good support on the capital planning committee. And I'm pretty sure very good support of the board of selectmen so that uh, we really need the uh, Darius, you and, and your crew to get a solid proposal on that to us ASAP. Um, that's number one. Number two, because of the fact that these projects require only bo select board approval, uh, the stuff that we submitted for consideration in this budget cycle uh, could actually be approved to you know start the work uh, pretty darn quick. So that I look at something where we put in for, you know, PA system is broken. And normal procedure would be that that money wouldn't be available until uh, next July 1st. And, you know, we could probably get that done within a month. If, you know, you, if you were going to, you know, if you guys could figure out how to do it and get somebody in to do it in a way that wasn't disruptive of school or something, I'm sure we could move that forward pretty quickly because that seems to me, you know, a perfect example of, of 
taken advantage of, of, of the possibility of the situation, uh, you know, in a way that, that benefits, you know, benefits us a good bit. So, you know, I would think on that one, and if there are any of the other three things we submitted that, boy, it'd be nice to get going on that before um, July 1, well, we need to just make the case. Okay, but I need I need the support from, you know, you and, and Bill and whoever else with the with the facts and figures to, you know, make sure that we can get approval. So can I expect that? Yeah, um, that's great news, Peter. Um, so we already have Bill got two quotes um, for the windows. Numbers at 125 now from up from 100 um, to do 33 windows. And so he, you know, got that for this meeting, um, and you know the other. I mean, if you want me to come to a planning meeting where you know now that you have this kind of new set of is, is the is the is the capital meeting taking running the ARPA funds? Uh, that's where we stand. I mean, we, basically, we will. My, my sense is that that. We will make a recommendation or recommendations probably, but there will be more than one oh, segment of these these recommendations over the next year or two. But we we will be making them to the select board. They'll get reviewed by the finance committee with the select board, and then they'll go ahead and vote on them. Um, and you know that can happen. You know, unless it's a real emergency, you know, who knows how fast it can happen? That's to, that, that's to be seen. But yeah, it's definitely going through our committee first. You know, we have uh, we have a selectman, David Pierce, is chair of our committee. Uh, town administrator Jeff sits in on them. You know, he's the one that you know, organizes all the stuff for the meetings. Uh, members are Rock Warner, uh, Dana Roscoe, representing planning board. Lawrence Starr now is representing the library. I'm representing the school. Uh, a couple others, and so on. But yeah, that's it happening. That's that's great. That's a setup with other communities doing the sense of getting all shareholders from all the different points in the community to discuss those funds. So, I guess I guess my question to you is what what do you need from me exactly? I want we can talk, and we can talk offline too. We can talk. We tomorrow. can talk offline, but basically, I want I want for sure to get that windows. We got a next meeting in two weeks from tonight. Okay, okay. We're, meeting, we're meeting every two weeks on a on a Tuesday. Okay, and and for the next meeting, I for sure want the window stuff in there. I want it in there soon enough so that that can get distributed to committee people before the meeting, um, with as you know, good data about you know, make sure we, we you know that it, there's a clear case that these are hard numbers we're talking about too, um, and then also the question on any of the four projects we submitted, if there's a wish to move ahead faster on them, well, that needs to be you know. And that that doesn't need a lot of English to go with it. It's just like, yeah, if we could get this fixed now, that'd be a whole lot better. Okay. Well, now some stuff, it, some stuff, it may be like, yeah, it'd be nice to get it fixed, but you know, we we can't really do it while we're. You might know, don't know about the dishwasher in the cafeteria. If that's really better, just left off till the summer, kind of thing, or um, you know, the stuff in the uh, uh, fixing the stuff in the sprinkler system, you know, may be like, well. Yeah, it's not going to get done soon enough to to make them safer for this winter, and so we'll just deal with that next coming summer. Yeah, I think, you're, I, think you're, I think you're answering your own questions pr pr almost perfectly. We'd love to get yeah, the system done ASAP because in a in a case of a emergency, we don't have the ability to use it right now. So right. I agree with that. I believe the the flushing of the system is the maintenance thing, and it can be done held off. It has to be, should be done this year, but it can be held off to the summer when crews have to go. And I don't know if they have to change heads or do all that and give them all the costs and where all the sprinklers are. So I think you're nailing everything almost exactly as I would say it. I can try to get you firmer numbers. Um, you know, a, a, a job of that size is going to have to be bidded. And so, you know, people are not going to, they're going to give us hard enough numbers up until they have to bid it. And then they're going to give us those real numbers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bill did say you got two different sources on those numbers. And I'm sure it's slightly probably rounded up slightly, but I can try to get him to give me who gave me those numbers. Should I fill out a capital request form for those windows so that it answers all those questions? Or yeah, I think I think that would be real useful. I mean, we got a procedure where 
you know, standard form that everybody submits on the same form with, you know, answers to various questions. And yeah, I mean, you know, basically everything we can do to try and smooth the way. OK, we got to do and, and even something that would give details about, you know, where we got the numbers for, where we got the numbers from and the, you know, concerns about still having to go through a bid process and what that might mean and so on. What we you know, one of the advantages of this Arbor money is that if you uh, if the bids come in too high, you certainly can still make the decision. OK, we're just going to spend a little more Arbor money on it. If the bids come in too low, the money that isn't spent just goes back in the pool and can be used for something else. And. And, and so from that point of view, it's uh, it's better than municipal spending usually is. Okay. I'll okay. Put that, I'll put that together. And if you want me at that next meeting, let me know. If you need me uh, to what I'd there. suggest is um, let me get back to you on that. Okay. I'll check with Jeff who runs the meetings. And I was surely hoping to have you uh, at, at one of these meetings. And I'll just ask him whether he wants you at the next one or the one after whatever. Okay. Thank but you. I just think that, you know, there was just before I left the meeting, to come here, there was like, you know, there was one, Dana in particular, and Dana just said, look at, he says, we got to, we got to do the windows. He says, if we go through this and we don't do the windows, he says, you know, you can, you can, you can bond something like, uh, you know, one of these big highway vehicles we're going to be needing. He says, you can bond that and people will vote for that at town meeting. People voting for the windows, you know, that's a, that's a harder, that's a harder ask. And uh, so he says, we got to get this done. And, and nobody was objecting. Right. Okay. I agree. Thank you. Okay. Peter, one more thing, if I could add um, in regards to the dishwasher, while it's not an immediate need to have it replaced and we probably wouldn't replace it until summer anyway, I know that our pricing on these type of equipment is going up more and more every day and the time to get the equipment in is also taking a really long time. So if that were something that we could lock in and get ordered with ARPA funds so that it's here and ready for the summer, that would be helpful. If not, you know, it's not a big deal, but just something else to consider. But can you can you take that and, you know, either with, you know, whatever Darius is sending in, okay, you can actually just make that point for the committee and put it right there. If we can, you know, get the approval and, 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 and you know, lock in the order and lock in the price now, okay, for summer installation, okay, and, and again, get this, get this in front of our committee coming from you guys, that helps me a lot. I, I will, what we'll do is I'll, I'll write up, I'll put up this, the windows together, and then I'll also write up where we are with our capital projects. I'll take our current capital list that we have, because there's other ones, because that's when I originally went to the select board last month, to say there's $85,000 worth of stuff that are all ones in our list, but we only can choose the top four because we're trying to be reasonable to what the town can afford. So at least I can give explanations so when people are looking at the list, they can see what we're looking at. and. If they want to go there, they can go there. If not, I understand that too, but I'd rather them have the information in front of them. Yeah, I, 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 want, to, well. I want you to, you know, be taking, you know, how, at least a couple more and, add, you know, filling out the whole forms on them and adding them there. And even if they're, you know, slightly lower priority, you know, if we don't, if we, if we don't speak up, we're not going to, we're not going to get stuff. And, um, right. Well, that's clear, right? And I also heard the other way, like, if we don't tell them, then it's shame on us for not telling them as well. It's not just right. speaking up, it's not squeaky, just squeaky real, but they can't make decisions on our projects unless they know about it. Right. That's great. Okay. That's Thank great. you. That's great. Thank you. So anyway, that's the capital report, I think. Better than anything I was going to say. On to the draft budget. Shelly, is that you? Event, the main event. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen. Shelly, do you want me to share so you can see people? I actually have it set it up so I can see both. I can see. Oh, because you have to, you're at work. Yep. Yeah, I've got it split screen right now, but thank you. Um, let me make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so I know everybody wants to jump and see what the number is, but for anyone that's listening or anyone new to the budget process, let me just explain what happens here. Um, so we start off building the budget on a needs-based, student-centered, while also trying to be fiscally responsible when we're looking at numbers for the next school year. 
Um, we take input from key stakeholders, so that includes any um, leadership positions, so IT, facilities, uh, principal, you know, Darius and Ben and I have many conversations throughout the process. Um, and we, our first step is to look at a level service approach, which we know does not necessarily mean level funding. Um, level service just means that we keep existing staff and existing programs in place. Um, but there is some inflation built into that because we do put uh, your benchmarks in for cost of living adjustments. While we're still in negotiations, we do have placeholders in the budgets for all five schools for uh, salary and wage increases. So I just wanna make that point that level service does not equal level funding. Um, and then we look historically, we'd usually do about a three year snapshot at each expense account to see if any expenses need to be shifted up or down, whether we've been extremely under an account and we can reallocate funds to something else that has gone over. So that has been taken into consideration here. Um, I mentioned the COLA, so that's contractual and non-contractual. So all staff in the in the building and in central office are put in this in the budget with a placeholder for the following school year for uh, raises. And then we consider new requests and new priorities, um, new initiatives. And this is one of our biggest challenges, especially with a really tight budget. Uh, we always want to talk about new needs to. Um, meet the needs of the students and the staff within the building and how we can make our programs more attractive and enhance them. Um, but we know that that costs money and with a tight budget that is challenging. But in this first step of the budget, that is part of the process. Um, and then we look at other expenses, um, transportation costs, out of district placements. Those are always things that we're not entirely sure where they're gonna land for the following school year, but we look at those. Uh, and then we analyze revolving funds to make sure that we're gonna have adequate revenues to continue to cover the expenses that were paid from prior years. So after considering all of those pieces, uh, Sunderland is looking at the first draft coming in at 6.31% or an increase of $191,520. Uh, we will use an additional 723,000 of revolving funds and grant monies to fully support the entire operating budget. So what I wanna say after saying all of that, we're gonna talk about what those key factors are that are driving that 6.31%. While I did mention that we consider new initiatives, that 6.31% actually does not include the new initiatives that Ben um, and other staff may have, or other directors may have requested as part of this process. When that came in, uh, and we did build the original draft, there was a request for some additional staffing, which would have caused an additional 2.31% increase. Um, we know that that's just not feasible. And the other factors that are driving the 6.31% increase, we really don't have a lot of control over those. They're things that are naturally going up based on actual numbers. Um, so we did pull out those requests, but I, I want to give Ben a few moments to talk about them because much like the ETL position, it's something that could come up for several years and that eventually we may be able to support. Um, so we're looking at, for key factors, a uh, $12,000 increase in wages to cover the full-time district nurse leader position. This has been previously fully funded or partially funded as it is this year by a grant. Um, that was a multi-year grant, and by the, I want to say the fourth year, but it could be the third year, we have to pull that money off the grant and put that position fully on budget. So that position is split between all five schools. Sunderland's portion of that full salary is 12000 so that is an increase directly to the budget. Um, a few years back, in order to bring the budget percentage increased down a little bit. We skimmed some funds off of certain accounts. Custodial wages is one of them that was cut back. Um, we did a reduction of $8,000, which is 100,000 for summer programming and 3,000 earmarked for overtime wages. So uh, I'm recommending that we add that back in. Sunderland has done without a significant level of summer support for I believe two summers now. Um, and we really just need to shift that moving forward. I don't have to tell you all or anyone who's, who knows what the capital needs are. The building needs love and attention. And in the summer, 
those are the time, that's the time when we can really focus on some of the smaller things that we can tackle in house, whether it's painting, deep cleaning, whatever it is. Uh, so we're advocating to have that added back in. Overtime is minimal district wide throughout all of our schools, but it does happen on occasion. You could get your night custodian that calls in, so your day custodian is covering because that work still has to get done. Um, there could be weekend things that come up that are not funded from another, you know, an outside external source. Um, so it's a minor amount of money, but it does have an impact overall. Uh, technology, we're looking at a $13,000 increase. This is not new initiatives. This is simply to properly fund existing expenditures on uh, existing account lines. Every school is seeing this happen. So over the last few years, uh, we've added additional software to support curriculum. We've made changes in technology, such as now we're using Parent Square for our broad um, cast communications. So those pieces obviously come with increased price tags, and we also typically see um, COLA increases on some of those year to year if there's something that we're repeatedly using. So again, not a new initiative. We're just writing these accounts. Um, we talked about this with the current budget. So we are seeing an increase in special education transportation that is going to roll over into next year. Uh, Karen, our, our Karen Ferrandino, our special education director, estimates that Sunderland's increased cost for special education transportation is going to increase by sixty-four thousand um, dollars. This is one of those lines that fluctuates, and uh, right now, that is the estimate that we're looking at based on current routes for special education students. Uh, there's a thirty-four thousand dollar increase to employee separation costs based on estimated sick buyback payments, and then those wage adjustments that we already discussed. So that sort of sums up where those key factors are. Um, and before I keep going, Ben, do you want to take a minute to talk about, or a couple minutes to talk about those new initiatives that we have already eliminated, but were part of our original conversations? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, thanks, Shelly. So, um, and I'll, I'll start with the uh, bottom bullet item there first. Um, right now, we have an occupational therapist who is there four days a week um, at point eight. And um, we were looking at increasing that to full time at Sunderland. Our occupational therapist, who's absolutely incredible, um, when looking at their schedule right now, it's um, filled with direct service hours along with consults. And um, given the ever increasing need of our, our students and their self-regulation, um, right now we're not seeing that she has the opportunity to provide that tier one and two support to our students. So like I mentioned, a lot of her services right now are direct service and which is on the grid in the IEP. And it's not allowing for extra opportunities for students who, um, you know, teachers or staff members might be concerned about to provide um, interventions to see how we can provide them with additional support um, prior to the special education referral process. So this has been an ongoing discussion for a few years, and we were really hoping to get that into the budget for, for this year. Um, additionally, we are looking to um, provide um, more therapeutic support to our students who may have intellectual, social, emotional um, develop development needs um, to provide behavioral support for students who maybe, maybe have behavioral or emotional uh, disorders. And there's so many different roles and um, responsibilities that a school adjustment counselor can take on. You know, they, they would work hand in hand with uh, myself, the SPED team, and especially our um, school counselor and psychologist. And we're just seeing that um, there's definitely there's definitely the need um, now more so than ever after, after the uh, pandemic. And so it's just, um, you know, if, if it doesn't work out this year, and, um, you know, we hope there's some magic wand that would allow it to, um, but it, it does, as, as we talked about with our earlier discussion, it needs to get on, um, everyone's radar. Um, so at at we at least start talking about it. 
Okay. Any questions? Any questions for me before I keep going as well? Peter? Yeah, just make sure I understand some correctly. The 34000 you had for sick buyback payments, that in, that's tied in with a couple of retirements? Yes. Two specifically? Just because we'll probably get asked. Um, I have to pull up the... Is that something that in prior years we've, or the last couple of years, or at least last year, we went to the select board and they made a separate warrant article for it? Yeah, we did. Um, and I, what I tend to do, and we did this last year also, is we throw it on our budget initially so we can see what the impact is. And then we do, we did ask them last year. So if that is something that you all um, are supporting again, then we can pull that off. And obviously that'll have a a decrease in the budget that's about a one percent a little bit more than a one percent increase um right, right. And sunderland has uh two payouts for next year because okay. because they have they've actually been the ones that have been wanting to do it that way so it seems to me we ought to go along with it Yeah, Darius and I would definitely recommend at least putting in that ask, especially um, if there's no limitation on the ARPA funds and they have those funds available and could use it for that. You know, obviously, their decision on how they want to fund it, but um, it has been something that they've supported twice now for the district to pay on yeah. more. And I just, I just want to reiterate that this is the first round of this budget. So we, there are some decisions that are pretty straightforward that we could do but it's your budget, so we wanted to start with, this is what the whole thing looks like, and then we start working together about picking it away. We could have we could have trimmed the tree a little bit here and then brought it forward, and then you don't see the full how we got there as well. So, um, but absolutely, the pulling out $34,000 out would be one of our easy recommendations. Um, we probably use the ARPA funds for it if they wanted to, but. Okay. Well, but, but they just, the concern on their part is that uh, by paying for this, this particular thing separately because it bounces can bounce up and down significantly each year it makes tracking the rest of the budget a bit easier and you know it's fine with me because it's like yeah great we got a less increase than we would show otherwise jessica uh i just wanted to make sure that we're not yet talking about applying esser funds to any of this we still have remaining esser funds no no, so ESSER funds have been pulled completely out of any budget impact for next year. So the way that we built ESSER 3, which we have not fully spent, um, but the way that we did map out the spending was that anything that had been paid in FY22, which is primarily early childhood wages and food service wages, the plan is to get those either back on budget or onto a revolving fund for next year. The ESSER funds are primarily mapped out for um, PD, curriculum, learning loss, uh, those kind of pieces, um, some facilities related things, HVAC and things like that, um, but not earmarked to offset the budget with salaries and wages. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm not sure if I understand that. Does that mean that in this budget that you're presenting, is there any is there any ESSER money being used as a revenue source? No. But there obviously has been in the FY22 budget in the just the general offsetting some of the general fund type expenses, not just the revolving funds. Um, they were just for revolving funds. ESSER on uh, 22 is only funding early childhood and uh, school lunch. Okay. So the idea is in FY23 to move those items back to those revolving funds. But then how much extra money would still be available starting in FY23? Um, so the, the budget right now for ESSER that's separate from this does not include covering any salaries and wages at all or any budget budget related things. We're talking about um, new initiatives, uh, enhanced summer programming, pieces like that that are not included in this presentation. But, okay. All right. 
I mean, we had to apply for ESSER. We could modify our grant if we really needed to. We had to apply for ESSER over the summer, you know, well before we even started thinking about this. And we had the intention of moving those expenses on ESSER two back to other funds that the school could manage and using ESSER three for other things. Um, again, we certainly could amend and modify that grant if we needed to. Um, but I would also obviously want to loop in the curriculum department because a lot of that money is earmarked towards um, supplementing learning loss, summer programming, enhancing professional development, things like that. Okay, um, I guess I'll keep going and then we'll see what other questions come up. So I'm not going to go over all of these data points, but I did want to give you some general information to think about and look at. Um, so the way that the budget is built, there are various function codes that are set up by DESE. That is how we, we report what our expenses are year to year. Um, anything under 1,000 is administration, 2,000 education and instruction, 3,000 is student services, which includes um, transportation, school lunch, uh, athletics, although that does not revolve, uh, pertain to El Sunderland Elementary, um, and then the health office, so nursing or, or anything along those lines. 4,000 is operations and maintenance, so primarily facilities and IT. Um, 5,000 is benefits and insurance, and I just want to point out here that does not include um, any insurance that the town pays, uh, health insurance or anything like that. This is strictly, um, it's primarily central office insurance costs, Sunderland shared portion, and then that retirement falls under that 5,000 category. So that's what's driving the significant increase here is that $34,000 increase to that line. Otherwise, that would be much lower. Um, and then 9,000 is out of district placement. We do have out of district placements that we're anticipating for next year, um, but they will not be paid from budget. They will continue to be paid from school choice because we will receive those funds back um, from special education increment claims. That was a decision that was made um, this year for an existing student. And there is unfortunately one new student that is in the pipeline because the current student will age out. Um, we had talked about that being a one year expense, but there is someone in the pipeline right now that special education department is working with the family. So there's a chance that that could go away, but it is another choice student. So again, it'll be money in and money out. So there's nothing hitting the budget line here. Um, so salaries and wages, uh, I wanted to show you of the total increase, what percent correlates with sal salaries and wages and what correlates with other expenditures. Um, you can see that there's more other expenditures than there is salaries and wages. That's being driven by the uh, retirement and then the transportation costs. Um, that's, that's inflating that number there. The other thing that I want to mention with salaries and wages, you can see under the educational staff, that percentage is 23.93%. And I actually am seeing that higher um, at most of the other schools. But Sunderland has had so many changes in staffing this year that there's been savings um, that hit after last year's budget was approved. And we're moving people around. So we may have had a teacher that was um, on to budget in 22, but now we're moving to early childhood. So that changes how, how all of this plays out. And some of that does happen behind the scenes before you guys see this initial draft. So um, I just want to mention that because it doesn't seem like a, a very significant increase. Um, and that doesn't necessarily correlate to dollars that the staff are receiving. So the increases will be much more significant in that this is just the portion that's hitting the budget. If that doesn't make sense, I can try to be a little bit more clear on that. Uh, and then same scenario here, wanted to give you the overall percentage of salaries and wages compared to non-salary and wages expense for the total budget. Um, so I'll give you a minute to look at that. And some historical information for general fund increases. Uh, last year we went in at 2.75. The prior year we did, um, while we did level service, we had no increase. So we had to cut or move things around to different funding sources. 
Um, and the prior year was the year that you all went for the override with that 13.62%. Um, and then some enrollment data. So you can see Sunderland is coming back up. It's not significantly up, 189 from 184, but it's good to see our numbers increasing again. Uh, and then the bottom part there is just the percentages of what a 1% increase is, a 2% and a 3%. The other thing that I want to talk about is um, other funding sources. So Peter mentioned getting an update on all of those revolving funds. I will work on that for next month. But I did want to mention that, you know, again, we are placing wages back on early childhood. We've been able to build up reserves and we are expecting normal capacity next year. So um, Amy smith Seely has given me projections on what she believes the revenue will be. So we are placing staffing wages back on that account. Uh, we are placing wages back on school lunch. The school lunch program is doing pretty well so far this year, and we expect that that will continue. So we will use those reserves to fund next year's. And then um, any revenue that we bring in next year will replenish the account. Uh, also, circuit breaker, we will see a little bit of circuit breaker revenue. Um, we won't see any in 22. I know that came up as a question last year, but we didn't hit the threshold. Uh, the student that went out of district mid-year because it was a prorated tuition, you have to um, meet a certain dollar amount before you will get any part of reimbursement. So we didn't get any in 22. Uh, special Education Department is projecting that we might see around 30,000 next year. I'm budgeting conservatively and going less than that in case that number changes, uh, but we do have a placeholder in there to cover some wages with um, circuit breaker funds for next year. So that's actually helpful for us. Um, hard when, when someone goes out of district, but at least we're getting a little bit back uh, to offset. And uh, school choice, I'm sure you all want to look at those numbers and I do have projections. I'm going to stop sharing this screen and share another screen. Can you see that? Is it big enough? Good. Okay. So it gives you some historical data. Uh, I think it's most important for us to talk about FY22, what our projections are, and then FY23, what we're looking at for next year. Um, our enrollment number has gone down from 21 to 22, from 52 to 48, but the revenue projection hasn't changed a ton because we do have special education increments that we didn't have previously. So I don't expect that number to change very much. Um, our expenditures in the current year are much higher than they were in the prior year. And that is because we intentionally had savings from the prior year that we moved into choice knowing that we were going to spend more than we were bringing in. Um, we're still doing a decent job, I think, uh, compared to some of our other schools as far as not overspending too much, you know, 100000 it, it is a lot of money for a small school and a small budget, but there's some other instances where it's much more extreme. So um, end of the year this year, we are projecting to have just shy of 420000 going into 23 for a budget. Um, I'm... I'm recommending that we do not overspend as much as we did this year. We don't have cherry sheets out yet, so I don't know what the initial estimates would be. So I'm going off of the current year's numbers and hoping that, you know, even though we have a decrease in enrollment again, we're going from 48 to 42, which automatically results in some revenue loss. Um, the special education department does think that our increment claims will continue to be up. So I haven't dropped that down yet. Of course, this could all change, you know, in the coming months, depending on what cherry sheets look like and then uh, actual special education enrollment. So um, I'm, I'm projecting that we drop that down for expenditure slightly over this year and then looking at ending next school year with 370000 uh, I think that that's a far better position than Sunderland has been in a very long time, especially after recovering from some of the things that have happened over the last couple of years, particularly loss of revenue in our revolving funds. You know, if we go back to FY20, you started the year with only 94,000. 
I know that we've talked repeatedly about not overloading school choice. I know that the town wants us to make fiscally responsible decisions with this. Um, but the next piece that I want to talk about, unless anyone has other questions, is what direction you want us to go in moving forward. Uh, are we comfortable putting another 50,000 of the 6.31% increase onto school choice? Um, you know, again, we still have a healthy reserve. It still feels relatively comfortable. Do we try to bring the budget down by using more of these funds? Or what other avenues do you recommend we take moving forward, such as the one that Peter already mentioned and requesting that the town cover that retirement payout? So I think that about covers everything, unless you have other questions. And then again, looking for your feedback on moving forward for the next draft. I would ask uh, about the school choice. Um, the number of students we had in the program that we have in the program currently has dropped a bunch since last year. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of ebb and flow in where people are taking their kids to school, particularly in the last year or two. Um, is there, I mean, is that something? So the number right now is 42. Is that something that, uh, Ben, you have any feel as to where that's headed or we have any feel as to where that's headed? I think Ben had to jump off. Um, Darius, is that right? Did he jump off? Yeah, Ben had to leave. Um, yeah, I mean, so you, you can see that our, if you go to the, go back to the. You, guys you want to see the enrollment tab, Darius? The enrollment page, yeah. yeah. You can try to find patterns, but, you know, basically, uh, you know, resident enrollment is took a, a big jump from 20 to 21 um, and choice did not jump. And if you look for where the choice loss is, it's kind of scattered throughout. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with COVID. I you know a lot of families that um, chose to um, you know, roll, uh, homeschool, you know, that kind of stuff and didn't want to return. So, you know, it is a hit. You know, Ben would have maybe know more of the, you know, more of the color commentary about more exacts on that. Um, you know, looking at the pre-K program, there's not a lot of choice sitting in there either. Um, it's a little healthier than the year before. And so it'll be interesting with our kindergarten. We don't have kindergarten enrollment yet. And so we'll have that by the time we get to the, the voting on this budget will be in March, you know, so we'll have an idea um, of kindergarten registration, at least to get some idea of what, where we are there. Um, the class sizes, I had a long conversation with Ben about. Um, a lot of, you know, there are several of them that are getting, you know, tight in numbers. Um, and we might be able to do some movement there, but he also wants to see, you know, where registration comes in. Um, you know, right now, the... Uh, can I go up my notes here? The kindergarten is is two sections, and um, you know, basically twenty one students. And so the question is, in first grade, you know, uh, you know, what do we do there? There's also um, one section is currently in first grade. The rest have two sections. Um, on that list. So looking at that, you know, as soon as we, we make that decision too early, we lose the ability to, to, to backfill that with choice. And then you're stuck with a small class, but it also, um, you can see, we have to see where the town enrollment, you know, how many people are out there that are in that grade um, that may be coming back, you know, you can see. So again, I think I need to have Ben as part of that conversation. I think we should tee him up ready for the for that you know for the February meeting we we'll look at the budget again um, about those trends. Questions on that? So recommendations on where we go from here. Oh Keith, do you have a question? I think I was gonna add to what you were just gonna ask. I was, I, I, um, like, I feel like I almost fell out of my chair when you said, like, school choice is in good position 
and we're in a better shape than somebody like that. Those are words that like I haven't heard in a long time. Um, so I would, I, I wouldn't want to uh, offset the budget by using any school choice at this point, unless we that's a, a, a last ditch opportunity. Um, I think what I've heard from a select board in the past is that that does not provide a real budget for them. I think that we have to give them what the real budget is and then, and, and see what we can do. And then it, it, as a last ditch, no other option than that. That's something we could use. And then I, I do think that we can look, take a look at the numbers of what we can offer school choice. I think that we can play with it a little bit. Um, again, conversation with Ben, but I think that um, looking at some of the numbers, looking for patterns, I, looking from year to year it looks like a lot of the kids are coming back um but i don't think we have to rush into making our school choice decision right away but i think that we do have some flexibility in what we can offer in terms of school choice opening the season. thanks keith anyone else have thoughts on school choice the other thing is just thinking about school choice, I'm thinking out loud, you know, I, I know that I mentioned the one out of district placement that could be paid from school choice next year if it comes to fruition that that is um, not an out of district placement that would free up additional funds for us to move something from budget. So that could be a decision that we make in the next round when we have some more information. Yeah, I, I definitely. Uh Okay, so if we move the retirement to uh, the special, if the town, uh, the number as a percentage looks like one that's not going to, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, it always hurts to say uh, that school adjustment counselor that we were planning to hire, we can't bring on this year. And yeah. We could always eat into the uh, choice, but I'm, there's part of me saying that, that Keith is probably right, the right thing to the, for the town, maybe to hold off for this year. But I just want to understand, and uh, we'll take this up again when Ben is back, uh, that's probably something that's not going away. I mean, we talked about the exploding special needs uh, in the community before COVID hit, and COVID has not made any of those needs less. Um, so just directionally speaking, it feels like we may be able to put that off this year, but it's probably not going away. Peter? Um, a couple questions. One is, uh, Darius, do you know at this point how the breakdown for the four towns will be on the frontier budget as to whether Sunderland will get hurt or helped? No, we don't have the information until the governor released his budget. So. We're kind of in a holding pattern of what the assessments to the towns will be because that comes out of that. Okay, because even though that doesn't affect our budget, it affects the town, and then there, therefore that affects us. Um, secondly, Chili, do you have any predictors if someone will be up this year, or do you have no idea either? Okay. Well, we got hurt last year, and um, do you, do you, Shelley? Maybe I just wondering what the other uh, three towns are doing are looking like for their budget. Uh, increases uh, for the elementary schools at this same point in the process? I mean, first drafts for everyone across the board are well over 5%. You know, I, I think Deerfield's probably the closest to um, Sunderland, but everybody is starting a little bit high. The difference is, is that those budgets do include the new initiatives, whereas in your draft, that's at 6.13 or 3.1. I, I lost it in my head at the moment. Um, that does not include the new initiatives that Ben talked about. We would be at nine something if we included those in there. So, um, you know, it, it gives them a little bit more flexibility in the other schools because they can say, okay, we really wanted this position, but we can't afford it. So let's start by backing that off first. Um, Sunderland has things that can't be helped. I mean, we can't help if our transportation costs are going up by $64,000 over the prior year, which is, again, in part of what's happening in the current year, things that happened after we had the budget already set. So, you know, some of that we just can't, um, we don't have control over. 
the other pieces, you know, I, we could pull off the 8,000 in custodial, we could pull off the 13,000 in technology and play with that as the year pans out because there's always some type of movement. So, you know, that's another 25,000, which is nearly a percent. So we figure out how we muscle through another summer with no custodial support um, or no extra custodial support. And um, we make do with covering the overages and the software accounts from other lines. You know, maybe our utility bill isn't as high next year as it was this year, just as an example. So there's always some of those accounts that have some fluctuation. Um, it's not ideal to budget in this way because we're, you know, borrowing from one line to pay for another until something else comes up. But it is a way for us to bring that number down almost um, a percentage point, just eliminating those two pieces. So um, just kind of throwing some other options out there for us. I would think that I would think um, uh, for now it would make sense to just strip out the 34,000 because that's sort of a given for the retirement costs and then leave it at that um, in terms of, because this has to be, I believe the schedule for, for making the presentation to the select board is not until either late February or early March. Um, but obviously we need to give them some numbers just because they're putting a, I mean, I assume this gets passed on to the, uh, to the, to, to the town as far as where we stand right now. And I think that's perfectly okay. You don't pass this on. You don't tell them anything until late February. I, this, this is a useless number for them right now. You know what I mean? In a sense of it's nowhere near where we probably will land. And unless you tell me to pass it on, it's, it's your budget. So I've been very clear with the towns and this is happening in multiple towns. This is your budget until you hand it off. And so when they ask me to come present, I kind of respond by saying, no, you have to ask the school committee. And then they ask me, I work for the school committee. They're my bosses. And then I help them. And obviously Shelly helps me in the, in the sense of creating those budgets. So right now, the, this process is we don't have the state budget. So we don't have any indication of what the, that funding is going to look like if that's up or down. This is very rough. We're kind of, we threw all the ingredients on the table. And now we're going to have to start pulling things off. To you know, as Shelly said, you know, we have to cut and just we don't. We could also cut partial. We could say, okay, you know, let's go with you know four thousand for custodian, and, and we'll, we'll we'll make an, an effort to put, and, and we can we can do that. You can charge us to say, okay, guys, show us what three and a half looks like, and we'll go back and we will say, okay, the first thing obviously was we'll remove that for as you said to drop it down to five something um, to get the uh, the teacher by you know. Uh, day buyback out. We then will look at some of these other things that we say, you know, we wanted to go here, but we, you know, we can't, um, that kind of thing. Then we talk about, here's some options with school choice. We then will say, we at the same time, we'll say um, enrollment is here and that kind of thing. And then the way I have it timed out is that next meeting is a really more in-depth conversation with updated numbers, some scenarios. And then March, is when we make to start making decisions on that's what would be like the heavy decision month because you'll have different scenarios and then we'll have even more information at that point we'll have kindergarten enrollment at that point we'll have you know those kind of things and then we can start looking at if we're still in a really tough spot you know you know going back and looking at class size you know are we going to run class of 21 in two sections I mean, that's going to be something that we're going to have an honest conversation about, and it really needs to happen at your level because that's going to set a tone, um, not only for the building, but, you know, once you said that, you're not going to be a lot of school choice, in, you know what I mean, at that grade level. And then so you, you're, 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 you're making cuts based on, you know, future projections, and you, we're going to get people in the early years more than we get them in the later years. So those are kind of all, there's a lot of different moving pieces. So there's a part doing it this way. You know, we, you know, Shelly and I went back and forth about how do you do this? Do we trim it down and hand you, you know, the, I use the cookie analogy, a partially cooked meal and then say, how do you guys want to finish this off? Or do we give you all the ingredients to show this is what we're dealing with? You know, um, obviously we trimmed out some stuff. And then, you know, we made the decision actually this week or was it late last week, right? late last week. Um, you know, it was at nine because we, we had those initiatives in there. We were like, I kind of feel like it wasn't responsible to give you a nine because you know you're like Darius, that's just a fake budget. 
You know what I mean? You can't, you know, and so, you know, getting close, you know, so I said, well, clearly we're just going to chop that off. So let's just chop it. And then we went back and forth. So we did, we compromised on our end. We we'll showed them what we wanted so that they have an idea of what was chopped. And so that was kind of what we were doing on our end. So, yeah, so I would, sending this on to the town without, they should watch this video. You know what I mean? Then they don't understand it. But if I send that number on, they're going to gasp. They're going to freak out. And then they're going to say, what do you, they're going to call us, you know, maybe irresponsible with money because the number is way too high. There's no way you can afford it. We all know that. And so I, mean, I guess I could write that message to them, but I don't send it to any of the towns early. You know, in fact, Frontier went the other route, but Frontier doesn't even release it until they have a, they actually sent us back the drawing board before they released it to out of um, the subcommittee because they don't want fake numbers out there causing rumors and you know other departments saying here comes the schools again they're going to ask for six percent you know what i mean and we're going to be all you know i'd rather not get into that that's that's how i feel about that peter but you know, you go to those boards you can explain where we're at you probably can do it better than me sending a message you can say where we're at but we're working on it and saying it's different than me sending an email that says this is our budget right now yeah i mean i now basically i write up the minutes for the meeting and and you know i write just you know minutes that reflect the meeting the way they're supposed to, but I send a copy to the select, mid, select board usually with some sort of note that says, here's what I think is important. Okay, if there's just one or two things I want to, you know, if they're not going to read the whole thing, I want them to read the one little paragraph I write. And that may be, here's where we are now, but it's a work in process. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to have, you know, a bunch more talking about it, both between ourselves and with them and so on before we end up wherever we end up. And I think that does no harm. Yeah. And so... But I would think I would think for the moment leave the number where it is except pull out that thirty four thousand. Might as well phrase cast that right from the beginning. It's a separate going to be paid for by a separate article. Excuse me. Yeah, I think that's, uh, in my opinion, also that's a responsible budget for how much information we know and for what we know about where the town is at. Um, and I, I'm certainly not going to direct you guys go back and and shave stuff off of there because we want it lower because there's there like so there's so many moving pieces that are, are left to uh to hit bottom uh but does it make sense to do some scenario planning so that you guys rather than try to crunch a lot of that into the the, the final stage uh if you want to spread out some of that work we've already started so you could say we like immediately once you get a budget you start saying okay if this doesn't fly, we start to contingency plan. The moment the last number, moment Chili hits send and it goes to me, she starts contingency plan. We've already met. We already have a, a draft of different ideas, which much of what we've already talked about tonight. All well, those different ideas, but where can we go different places on that? Um, because you got to remember, we're doing this five times, so we, we have to start all of them. It's too much work to wait, and then then to have other budgets explode. So we right now are scheduled to present to the select board on the 14th of March. So that's kind of our. You know, and you guys currently have a meeting on the 15th, which will, this is where at some point we got to fix this because we have public hearings. Our public hearing on the budget should include the select board. And that should be the public hearing on the budget where we get the feedback and then make, and then make some changes. But instead, I believe right now our public hearing is set for the 15th. We're going to present the select board on the 14th. So Shelly's going to give a presentation on the 14th and then give a presentation on the 15th. And then we'll figure out where that stands, um, you know, if we have to make a modification, then at that point we probably have to call for another meeting in the month of March, that following week, if we're still in a, in a tough spot. Um, town meeting is the 29th of April. It's not already on your calendar. Throw that in there. Um, maybe. Maybe. But we'll have it outside. Um, unless they're not prepared in that, at that point. Um, Frontier just so you know where Frontier lies, Frontier is looking to have their public hearing on March 1st. Um, right now, that's where it's kind of laying out, but we can still change that. All these dates can be moved around because they have their March school committee it happens to be on March 1st. Um, I don't know, we might want to, might want to talk to Frontier about changing that to March, but I'll do some math about the 45 days out from town and such that we have to meet by law. 
I think it's March 1st because we'd like to have a week prior to our due date in case there is problems with the public hearing. Right, Keith? I'm looking at you on that. We, we started to create more of a buffer after that one year where we got really tight, where we had to make changes, and we may have been in violation of the 45-day clause. Does that make sense where I said all that? Okay. So, so I think we, Sally and I, will come back in February with some scenarios, some ideas, some updated numbers, um, and kind of maybe start to categorize some of the decision areas. You know what I mean? And then it'll allow you to give you some organizational thoughts to, okay, how do you want to move things around? And so um, the good part about that is if we did that first, right now you've, you get to digest all these different moving parts. And so when we start talking about them again, you, you kind of know what we're talking about. Um, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and then and then we'll have we'll have the uh, cherry sheets by then. Um, I mean, the state's re the state's revenue numbers have been awesome, so I can't imagine that you know they're going to be, uh, you know, that they're going to be cut in chapter seventy, for example, um, or anything like that. So, no, our problem with chapter seventy is uh, because our enrollment has been in consistent decline, although it is coming slightly back up, not up enough to drive us to get more than the last year it was thirty dollars per pupil extra. You know, we're not going to see any big SOA money if they bring that back or you know, anything along those lines. So it's not going to be a significant revenue increase, but it, it at least won't be any less than it was the year before because right. we're in that hold harmless state. Right. Are we, are we still getting a rural aid? Yes. We, did we get a number for this year, this go around? Uh, we did. I don't have that in front of me at the moment. I, I could blast it out in an email. Um, we did get more, I think, than the prior year. And, We've been using those funds for various things um, that come up that we didn't have planned. Uh, and we've also been using some of those funds to at all five schools, because oddly all five schools got rural aid this year, which has not happened previously. Um, we've been using that to pay for, we talked about this a couple of meetings ago, the overages and the administrative costs due to uh, an administrator on leave. So. Um, we haven't had to hit budget with that expenditure because that rural aid is not restricted to specific things. So it's sort of been another um, revolving fund in a way for us to use it more freely. All right. Well, I guess if there's no other questions, that concludes my budget presentation for this evening. <laughs> we'll work on more for the February meeting. All right. Any uh, any reports from the uh, collaborative or any committees? All right. Then I guess on to the superintendent report. Um, yeah, we talked about most of the things on my list. The only two things we didn't talk about is, um, the anti-racism equity committee, um, you know, his next meeting is on February 9th and, um, the community dialogue series, um, Jen Smith said she'd like to come to our next meeting, but that's not until February, she, that next week dialogue is on February 17th. So, Kind of things are there's a quiet month for January. There's some the, the committees are meeting in their subcommittees, um, and so that, that's happening. I know there was a meeting yesterday of one of the groups um, of curriculum and professional development. Um, so there are these um, some small meetings happening in between the major meetings, but so no real reports on that. And then the other thing is that we are in a no negotiations. We have a negotiating meeting tomorrow, um, and things are going well. Um, there's not a you can choose to go to executive session and Jessica, you probably could um, give the the uh, super uh, not the superintendent the school committee's view whether or not they need to. We don't have a whole lot of details. We've just kind of done a lot of uh, laying the groundwork and talking about what numbers look like and doing some small smaller stuff. Tomorrow is is poised to be a big meeting because we're talking about a lot about finances and and you know pay. So. But that's up to you. It is on the agenda if you want to go to the executive session. What do you think, Jessica? Is there enough news to uh, make that worthwhile? 
I can talk about this topic a lot. <laughs> it's up to you if you want to hear it. <laughs> I have no objections. I, I mean, uh, if there's stuff to say, we may as well hear it. Um, so that sounds like we're going to, uh, unless, are there any other questions uh, about the superintendent's report? All right, and then after this, we'll, we'll probably leave uh, without going back on to the live meeting. All right, so... Uh, Executive session pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. Um, we're going to go into executive session, so I guess I'll see you all at that uh, meeting, and then we'll uh, roll call vote. There. Oh, yeah, sorry, roll call vote. Yes. My bad, uh, Peter. Yes. Well, hold on. Do we need to make yeah, a motion? We, we make a motion, and then uh -huh. uh, let's have a motion. So your motion, yeah, executive session, same paragraph you just read, pursuant Excellent. to NPL you know, chapter 38, section 21A3, to discuss, discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, teachers, and IAs. Second. All second, oh, good. Seconds. All right, roll call, Jessica. Yes, Megan. Yes, Peter. Yes, Keith. Yes, Greg. Yes. See you there.